So, Mike Cernovich, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast in your beautiful home. I really appreciate it. You may not know this story, but how I first heard of you, uh, for those of you who may not know the story, your wife and I were very good friends. We were in the same group, group of uh, Middle Eastern friends in this area of Laguna Niguel. And my roommate and I were driving to L.A., and Shauna was in the car with us. And we were just shooting the breeze. And my roommate, who was an attorney at the time, still is, saw an LSAT book mm -hmm. in her back seat and said, you know, are you studying for the bar? What's going on? She said, no, I'm just dating an attorney. I'm really trying to impress him. <laughs> so that was the first time I had ever heard of uh, Mike Cernovich. Here we are 12 years later. Got a beautiful family. Um, and I, having this podcast, I just want to chat with people that I'm very interested on. Mm -hmm. I follow you on Twitter. I really don't know anything else about you other than what Sean has told me and what I see on Twitter. And a couple things really stood out to me that really resonate with me as a new, new father, someone who trains martial arts, is you are all about homeschooling and not having our children be exposed to some of the things that public school has, especially current public school, not only with the curriculum, but my wife being a news anchor constantly discussing school shootings. And so my wife and I, having children that are approaching school age, thought about homeschooling. And then I read your Substack article on homeschooling and I showed it to her. And so I just want to know from someone who's experienced homeschooling, can you just tell me and the audience the good, the bad, what, what there is to know, you know, the highlights, the, the lowlights of homeschooling, everything. Right. The best part about homeschooling is it really is choose your own adventure. And homeschooling itself is a misnomer and almost bad branding. If you were to describe what people do, you wouldn't call it homeschooling because that's a narrowing definition. Mm -hmm. You hear homeschooling, you think kids are at home with mom and dad or with mom or with dad, whatever the case may be. You're swatting them over the wrist with a ruler and yelling at people and making them do stuff on the blackboard. And then that's it, right? Because one of the most bizarre critiques of homeschooling is, well, what about socialization? Right. What? It's like, okay, so you don't know anything about homeschooling, which yeah. is okay. It's okay to not know, but it's not okay to not know and then immediately argue against homeschooling based on ignorance. Right. So in our case, our daughters, they do which you would consider a homeschool pods. So what a lot of people do are, they call them pods or co-ops, where people throw in together to pay a salary for a teacher. And it's a bunch of kids. And then they go to an area a couple days a week. It isn't a full-time structured, you're going to school at 8.15, you're done at 3.15, and you're in a building five days a week, then you come home, and if you miss a day, you have to get a doctor, slip it, isn't anything like that. Right. It's voluntarism. You go in. Beer with kids all day, and then you do the rest of the curriculum at home. So, what the biggest challenge of that is, of course, you have to you have to have time, right? You have to have resources. I don't dog people who don't who aren't able to do homeschooling, right? Because you do need one spouse home more than maybe a lot of jobs would allow. Although work from home cultures change that, and you can fit it in. So there's ways to make it work even if you have a real job, you just have to structure your hours differently, structure your day differently to make the time. So realistically, you can teach kids everything they could learn in a school hour, two hours. We know that because the, we do tracking for the state of California mm -hmm. and we don't mind that. It's voluntary, you don't have to do it, but we, keep, we just make sure that they're testing sure. where you would be testing otherwise. Everything is on track, and it takes surprisingly little amount of time to teach people what they need to learn. And then you can go down rabbit holes with your kids. If your kid's interested in something, well, let's talk a lot about that, mm -hmm. right? You, maybe you're into art. Let's talk about art. The kids know more about classical music than I ever did. Mm -hmm. I, and I went through a phase in college where I did not feel like stupid. Because you get stupid, right? You learn things, and you live your life. And then you forget, yeah. and then you have to relearn too. So a lot of times my kids are listening to things, and they're the, they're the ones correcting me, mm. which I, I find pretty funny because uh -huh. they're, they're six and four. No, that's Vivaldi. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> so there, it's almost all upsides if you can make it work with your current situation. It's, it's pretty much all upside. 
Um, one of the concerns that I have to someone who, again, doesn't know much about homeschooling, mm -hmm. I read your article, the socialization issue actually does not bother me because like you mentioned in the article, you know, you're, you're, if one spouse is taking that child on every grocery trip or mm -hmm. mall trip, they're getting socialized still. Mm -hmm. And actually, it's probably better socialization because they're interacting with adults mm -hmm. in life-like circumstances as opposed to children constantly around them. Now, the one issue that I can think of is there's just a lot of time in the day, right? So even if, let's say, my wife was a stay-at-home mom, she has to keep them entertained some way, some, in some capacity. Now, unfortunately, we rely on screen time a mm -hmm. few hours a day. Mm -hmm. And I hate it, but it's just so easy. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do to prevent those, you know, just giving them six, seven, eight hours a day of screen time? Yeah, we tried to do quote-unquote reasonable screen time. And they became, especially the younger one, became a total addict. They get none other than occasionally a TV. So screen time has different definitions to different people. I consider screen time handheld devices, mm -hmm. iPads, iPhones, sure. laptops, and they get a little bit of TV time, educational stuff, Coyote, Peterson. And the, um, the answer to that, honestly, there's, there's a couple answers because there's a lot of layers to it. So the first layer is when people say homeschool socialization, even that question has a flawed premise. Well, I don't want these animals socializing my kids. I have to, all the time, my kids will come up with things that are just wrong that you hear from other kids at school. And we're with a more selected cohort of people who are more like-minded. You throw your kids in a public school, how many kids have pornography on their iPhones? How many kids, their parents are you know, bad or they're alcoholics Absolutely. or they're drinking? The people, our kids, their, their peers don't even eat sugar. So if we're a little, <laughs> if we're a little strict, then it's like... My one daughter says, oh, there's, is there red dye in this? I go, red dye, where'd you get that from? Right, because that's one thing you learn about when you have kids and you quote unquote socialize them is so much of your time is where did you learn, where did right. you learn yeah. that? <laughs> exactly. Okay, you're hearing about red dye now. What, what else are you hearing about? And th to the time issue is we spend a lot of time with the kids for sure, but we also tell them you have to learn to entertain yourself. We follow a lot of the Charlotte Mason principles mm. of homeschooling and Pet, I, I can never say the word right, pet, pedagogy. I, I, that's one of those words I'll never get okay. right, but the, it's the, the way that you teach, the philosophy of teaching. And a lot of it is to treat kids as people. And as adults, and I'm guilty of this too, terrible guilty of this, we've lost the ability to be bored. We've lost the ability for spontaneity. We've said, oh, I got, I'm standing in line at the DMV, well, I don't care. I'll just scroll my phone all day, which, sure, that's way less boring because my wife is a little younger than me and she read a book on digital jihad. And she, some people think there was this mythical time before phones where everything was great. You weren't on your phone and everybody just talked. Right, right. No, it wasn't like that at all. You were in line, you're like, what am I? And you'd read a book. <laughs> so instead of having your phone, you had a book, but right. you were still, it's not like everybody was just talking yeah. and it was kumbaya. That was always absurd, but we've decided that I don't, yeah, I don't want to be bored. I don't want to entertain myself. I want to be entertained by the screen. And that's a terrible habit to have for kids because in boredom you find spontaneity, you find insights. So even with myself, I'll take my dog for a walk. And I really got into, I was knocking out audio books. I was knocking out podcasts. I was being productive even in how I use my screens. But then I just said, you know what? When I take my walks now, and for, you know, five, 10 hours a week, depending on how many hours a day I walk the dog. Just me and my thoughts, just me. And when you go out with nothing, you're not reading your phone, you're not listening to a podcast, you're not talking to anybody on work. It's amazing what you come up with. Mm. It's amazing what you think about. But it's a lot of dead time. Mm -hmm. So what the phones teach you is dopamine, immediate response right now. Whereas thinking and contemplation might be, you might think an hour, and come up with one thing, whereas, well, but it's one thing in depth versus, because I'll think about a problem and then I'll think about it from a hundred different mm. angles. And when you're on the phone, you, oh, you feel like you have the illusion of all of this information was given to you at once and it's bullet points and it's made us all very glib where we feel like we know all, a lot more than we did, but we actually don't. Mm -hmm. And you just, it's okay to just take time, be bored, contemplate, 
And then as you're doing that, your unconscious mind is working and you're, and you're learning, learning these skills. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I tell the kids often. I go, look, man, you got to entertain yourselves. Yeah. You need to go in your rooms and entertain yourselves. You need to learn how to play together. You need how to occupy your time. You need how to learn how to read, just think, play a game. And when you do that, kids have the imagination. Yeah. So my kid now, she built a fort because we watched the show, one of those survival shows alone. Or there's a newer one that's a team-based one on Netflix. So we'll watch more educational mm -hmm. programming. Now she's building a fort, right? Mm -hmm. it's because you just give them that time. Mm -hmm. get, get, Go play. Yeah. And then they climb trees. They find blackberry trees. She likes to catch lizards. So that's how you get them away from the screens. I love it. Yeah. I want to go back to the, the pods that you created because that fascinates me. Mm -hmm. So how, I mean, are there Facebook groups? Is there a company? And how do you develop these pods? It's like so much in life. It's your personal network. You know someone who knows someone <clears throat> who has an angle. We've, you can probably find things on social media like-minded people. But the, the world is always whether you want a new job a new, when you're younger, where's a cool spot, yeah. a nice spot, you don't know. Even even when you have Yelp, you don't know. Where's the actual cool place right, right. where people go? Yeah, yeah. It's not on Yelp. Yeah. Your friend knows, yeah. right? And then you got to know somebody to get in. Mm -hmm. You got to have the hookup. Yeah. And that's a lot with these pods is it's not, it's not insular or snobby. They're very welcoming people. But you have to meet people in real life and get plugged into those. That We recently went to one at the, um, was it one of those parks? And they have little swap meets and you go and you meet people who are at homeschoolings because people homeschool differently. Mm -hmm. Some people do that. Uh, religious people, a lot of times, they do homeschooling at home. And then they do church. And then they do Bible, Bible study. Mm -hmm. There's vacation Bible school. There's a lot of different ways that you can homeschool. In our case, it's more like an outdoor pod where there was, um, I, want to think, I want to say they were in a school bus, mm -hmm. like a school bus that was refurbished into kind of a small classroom. They go in, they do a little class, and then they walk around, they hike, walk a little creek. Mm -hmm. It's really a choose-your-own-adventure. I love it. I love it. Another thing I noticed about you that we are very aligned on is, is putting our children in martial arts. Mm -hmm. You specifically, I remember Shauna said, uh, I think it was Syra or Rumi had jujitsu today. Yeah, and I I love jujitsu because mm -hmm. there's no impact, no trauma on the head. Mm -hmm. I like to strike. Probably not what mm -hmm. I would have ever advise my children to do. But in that, I've learned so much. I know my children mm -hmm. will as well. What has jujitsu or martial arts taught you, and what do you hope that it will teach your children? Well, I I was a lifelong martial artist, and I got into a lot of fights and boxed. So for me, it was more of a um, survival. You just I got picked on. You get picked on as a boy. You either become the boy who gets picked on or you get mean, yeah. but then you get like too mean and you become <laughs> what you fought against. Mm -hmm. And then you have this weird existential crisis where you're like, wait a minute, I was the victim and now I'm like the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. how, how did I become the bad guy? And you, you know, you want to modulate that a little bit. But as a man, it's different than as a woman or even as a kid. Yeah. So as a man, if you have a certain amount of a real combat, not just the, the pajama karate stuff, then you're just calmer. It's kind of like how dogs are calmer when there's a pecking order. I don't feel, and it's, it's very subtle, and you don't notice it unless you've kind of been through that veil, where guys around each other are very insecure. And it's because unconsciously they don't really understand the pecking order, so it's a lot of male anxiety. But if you've had a certain amount of le like legitimate combat arts and you've had your nose broken a couple times and you've had your eyes split open, and you've been beaten up, and you beat, you know, and you've beaten up other people. They're it just you're just more calm because you go in, you're like, okay, I'm not like worried about anybody, mm -hmm. but I don't want to fight anybody either. So you, you get that just level baseline. Absolutely. The last thing I'm gonna do is fight anybody. Get Absolutely. out of here, you know. But I'm not insecure about it, so I'm not thinking, well, what if that guy gives me a mean look? Yeah. So you don't have that weird male testosterone vibe. It's like dogs. Absolutely. And then you even know there's a pecking order. You're like, well, yeah, that guy probably could really. Kick my ass. I don't, you know, yeah, and you're yeah. just like, I don't care. It's yeah. just because it's just reality. But with kids, especially younger, you want to give them the grappling arts because in in jujitsu, in all grappling, is all about balance and base. Yeah. So I watch my daughter, and then we wrestle. And you notice this even with your kid being before jujitsu. Like if you pick, if I picked you up, and you never trained, your legs would flop around, and 
you would just be like a jellyfish. Yeah. Whereas a kid, you pick them up and immediately they get stiff. Yeah, yeah. They, their pressure from their hips is going right down. They're perfect grapplers. Yeah, yeah. You pick them up and they get strong and then yeah. you can barely hold them because it's like holding a log or a sandbag that's moving along. And then at some point you lose that connectivity. So when you're a kid you and you learn grappling, your entire training is based on base, balance, rolling, momentum, feeling the other person's momentum. So it gives a child a, a great base of athleticism for any kind of sport. And what the research has all shown is that you don't want to, even, even if you want your kid to be good at sports, which I'm not one of those sideline dads, mm -hmm. oh, I want my kid to be right. a BJJ black belt, yeah. take him to the turn. I don't care about any of that. Yeah. But you do want you to have your kid to have a base of athleticism. And then if your kid is 13, I want to play soccer. Well, what do you need for soccer? You need footwork, yeah. coordination. You need to know where you keep your eyes on the ball, how to move your hips. You need a bone, bone muscles, mm. right? Bone density, muscular strength, lig ligament strength. And grappling gives you a way better, other than maybe gymnastics, grappling gives you way more general athleticism than any other kind of sport that a kid could do. Absolutely. Another thing I noticed um, just from your Twitter is you like to discuss topics that, that stand out to me. Mm -hmm. Something that you've done very well is talk to your audience about the basics of financial planning, mm -hmm. setting up a trust or having life insurance or setting up a 529. And I don't think the general public understands the value of this. If you pass away and you don't have life insurance, mm -hmm. how fucked your family is. Mm -hmm. Or you know, the benefit of a 529, mm -hmm. people don't understand. Sometimes it can convert into a Roth and right. you can essentially build wealth for your children even if they don't yeah. go to college. So I love the fact that you're putting out these good information. At the same mm -hmm. time, I also love the fact that you, you just, you have no patience for people. You call them mm -hmm. goobers and mm -hmm. stuff like that. I love it. Do you, but at the same time, I probably know that there's a multitude of people who, who just don't like that. Mm -hmm. and, do you ever feel that, you know, you're being a little brash on Twitter and stuff? Like, does it make you feel bad or do you not care? Because and the only reason I ask that is because I'm very similar to you. I've got mm -hmm. thick skin. You can mm -hmm. say whatever you want to me. It's not going to bother me. But at the same time, I'm fairly brash. And mm -hmm. I don't mean to offend people. But if I say a fact in a certain way, it probably will offend people. It's It sometimes bothers me. And I, I want to work on that. But I'm just curious for someone who's very similar to me in that regard. How does it affect you? It's, it's complicated because on the one hand, a lot of people who lash out at you, lash out because they never had a male authority figure. Reset this one. A, a lot of people, when they lash out, they never had a male authority figure. They never had male friends. And they're kind of lonely guys who have daddy issues, right? A lot of boys have daddy issues. A lot of boys have mommy issues. Yep. And you think, I don't want to perpetuate cycles of trauma by being rude to this person. But on the other hand, you can't save everybody, and some people are just disruptive. And as a, I don't consider myself a content creator, which is what everybody else calls themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not that, oh, I'm Picasso, I'm, t I'm above content creators. Like, I just, I write shit, I have a message. This is my, this is what I believe to be true about the world. And if you don't like it, then don't read. Yeah. Go, go away. Like, I'm not begging people to read me. I could be way more popular than I am. I could be way more read than I am if I pander to people. So I do go back and forth between you want to be compassionate, you want people to not feel like they're being bullied. But on the other hand, I don't seek people out. They're rude to me first. Yeah. Right? It, it, it's, it's like they're bad customers. They're the people who go in the store and they harass people at, at the store because they think the person at this, like people think they have a right to heckle you. Yeah. Right? And then I, why do you have a right to heckle me? You show up and then they go, well, I didn't mean it like, you can always see them back down too. The moment, like the moment I hit back, you can always see them. Well, I didn't mean it like that. Or I was like, just joking. No, you, th you think you have a right to he heckle me because I'm out in public. Sure. You do have a right to heckle me and I have a right to uh, mm -hmm. heckle you back. Mm -hmm. Oh, you don't like it. Now I'm the bully. Yeah. Now I'm the bad guy. And that's another problem with modern society is it's where people who are the aggressors then play victim. Yeah. Right? I'm not finding random people in a bad situation saying, oh, look at you. Your life sucks. I don't do that. Yeah. But if you, if you come at me and you insult me and I, and I look at you and I go, well, yeah, like, you suck, dude. <laughs> You're a loser. Yeah. Like, why are you talking to me, right? But you initiated the aggression. Yeah, I get it. I, I know, listen, I'm the same way. It's just 
the advice other people give me. Was that coffee? No. Thank you. Break for oh, it's um, decaf. You want some? No, I'm okay. Um, I catch myself like it. It affects me in certain ways. Probably just in like my my friends messaging, because mm -hmm. I'm not very active on right. Twitter. But like, my friends will message me like, "Man, you've gotten kind of rude and mean oh, lately." Oh yeah. And yeah. I'm like, I'm ju I'm just telling it like it is. I'm, I'm not sugarcoating it. Um, That's different. And I went through that phase. That's a necessary phase of development that if you want to write or speak in a public forum that psychologically you go through that everybody goes through. Interesting. It's like puberty. You can tell everybody about puberty, but you go through puberty and your feelings just have to deal with it. Yeah, so when I started getting more political because I had or even not political, if you just have a point of view and you have a peer group, you're going to hear from Mama June, oh, that's rude, <laughs> or... The COVID's killing people. How could you post that? Or Shauna will get flack from her, or she used to, doesn't really anymore. They just unfollowed her based on stuff for me. Like, oh, did you see Michael said this thing? She's like, I mean, I live with the guy. Yeah. I know, right? What are, you, what are you doing? They're like trying to snitch on you. And I, so I went through that phase eight years ago mm -hmm. where I just, I, I don't have friends that I had yeah. anymore. I just don't. You're not, what are you, some kind of narc? You're some internet content cop? Why don't you go harass somebody else? And because they know you, they feel like they can. And then they want you to, like, spend hours getting up in your feelings, which I, especially if you have kids, I don't have time, man. Yeah. You need a therapy session. Yeah. You don't like the tone that I wrote? Do you go to therapy? No. Go, then go. Go to therapy. Talk to your therapist. Find out whether the tone bothers you. And then what they'll realize through therapy is, oh, I actually... The reason I don't like that tone is because it made me feel insecure. Mm. Right? An example I give when I talk about things is I'll say, you know, I think watching sports is a waste of time. Right? Okay. Who cares? Oh, but people do. How dare you? You're attacked. By but if I read a post that says if you smoke a cigar, you're going to die, I don't get upset by that because I'm like, well, obviously, I don't think it's that big of a health mm -hmm. thing to do every now and then, but I have an occasional cigar. Sure, I don't, but I don't feel attacked by right. it because I, I understand emotionally if I did, then I would examine the feeling, right? So what people do when they would go after you like this is they don't understand that they're having an emotional response to that and that instead of attacking you, they've, they've seen a mirror. Mm. So, oh, wow, I am a, maybe I spend too much time watching sports. Maybe I'm neglecting my kids. Maybe I, maybe I really am wasting my time. Maybe I haven't really thought about it that way. And then other times I'm like, no, actually I don't, based on a number of mm -hmm. logical reasons. But it's okay to examine those feelings. And most people, they don't have a healthy self-awareness mm -hmm. and a healthy connection to their own emotions. So they just want to lash out, you know, the expression, don't kill the messenger. They want to lash out at you. Do, you. do you think that there has been a good, solid president in the last 40, 50 years? If so, who would you Oh, consider? Trump is fantastic. For yeah. policy, for, for what, in what regards? Economy, everything? Economy was good. The, we didn't have a new war. First Absolutely. president in how many years did not start a new war. He tried to get us out of um, Afghanistan, but the generals just would lie to him. Mm -hmm. They would say, oh, oh we, we moved our troops out. They didn't. Tried to keep us out of Syria. So in foreign policy, Trump was by far the greatest president mm -hmm. of my lifetime. Not even, not even close. Mm -hmm. Domestically, he did what he could do, which was limited. I feel like his biggest mistake was he didn't, he didn't do enough, mm. right? So he, for all the attacks that he got, he wasn't extreme at all. If you look at what he actually did, he wasn't, he wasn't extreme. So he would have been a better president if he would have been what the media said he was, mm. which is okay, they're going to they're gonna claim you're doing all these bad things. And then, of course, COVID, he didn't have a great response to that. COVID, he was too late to it. Mm -hmm. If you look at 2020... People like me in January 2020 were saying, hey, COVID's coming. Everybody ignored it. COVID hits, kills all these people in nursing homes. And then by March, we're like, okay, we figured it out. If you're obese and old, mm -hmm. it's going to kill you. Otherwise, we're fine. But then everybody's like, lockdown. So like, wait a minute. And it was with me a very frustrating moment yeah, because cause now people associate me with the masking and the lockdown. It's like, wait a minute. If you actually go back and read my tweets, in January, I wanted a travel ban from China and I wanted things contained because old people were dying in nursing homes and then if you go look at me in april i'm like okay we know what it is now 
It's going to kill old people and fat people. So they probably shouldn't leave their house and maybe we'll get them food and whatever we can do. But mm -hmm. it's not going to kill everybody, certainly not kids. Then Trump's response was bad and the whole, you know, whole 2020 was a mess. But the reason I'm critical of Trump is because, not because of what the media said, but because, you know, 32 people died in the riots, which, by the way, were during the lockdown. Mm -hmm. But it's okay to riot now. Can't leave your house, right. can't go to your dad's funeral, but you can go to riot. And 20 billion destroyed. You look at Hamas. I mean, it's, it's a whole, that's why politics is funny because if you're outside the matrix, the power structure, the false consciousness, you would just look at like objective measures. So, you know, Shauna's parents, for example, are Persian, they hate Trump. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, no, but, but what I do is I don't get offended if you hate course, somebody. Yeah, yeah. You, I don't talk to you, but if you're family, then I'm, I'm going to talk to you and I'm going to meet you where you are. So I would just say this, oh, so you guys, you don't like Trump, he's bad. Okay. Who killed more people in the Middle East, Trump or Obama? Oh, well, that's different. And then, and then immediately, because I, I just use logic. I don't, I don't throw a tantrum. And I go, oh, who did the Iran deal? Oh, that was Obama and Biden. And oh, you guys are going to vote for Biden, but you're going you're gonna to go to the little protests now about the regime and yeah. oppressing women. Okay, well, the regime was doing that under Obama and Biden, not under Trump. Oh, you, you like Ukraine now? Oh, that's nice. Well, Russia didn't invade Ukraine under Trump. Russia invaded Ukraine under Obama and then under Biden. So if, you, if you're a logical person, but most people claim they are, but they're not, then you would just say, well, okay, so Trump said offensive things, maybe. Okay, I could, could say, sure, maybe. If you look at him in isolation. In isolation, everybody says offensive right. things. Sure, okay. I'll concede it. I don't care. I'm not a child. I look at body counts. So... Who's actually causing more human suffering? Who's causing more deaths? D and don't give me your bullshit oh, feelings and right. people feel that. I don't give a shit. Yeah. They're, you're like, what's the homicide rate now? After Black Lives Matter. Yeah. Oh, you defunded the police. Great. We can now look at the chart. Yeah. Who's dying? Oh, it's almost all black people. Right? Oh, but so you're not racist. Trump's racist. Republicans are racist. Okay, great. Fine. Whatever. But the Democrat Party policy oh they're not racist but their policies are leading to more people dying more job losses small businesses destroyed of all what are you talking about right? right so that that's how i think people have to learn to look about politics and, and uh, unfortunately they won't maybe because of the, the human nature mm -hmm. is probably always in this way but i just look at i just look at like same thing with covid show me the bodies yeah you tell me covid has a five percent death rate then that means that we should see bodies yeah we didn't see the bodies. Right. Oh, no, but you're not smart. You're not logical. Look at the, I don't need to look at the data, bro. Yeah. <laughs> right? I don't need to look at the data. There's supposed to be 5 to 10 million people. Yeah. And, it, and, and it's not. So, so that would be, my, I guess, my best, best advice for people who look at politics is I, I don't care what anybody says. I don't care if they're offensive. I don't care if I like them. You have to just have an objective reality, an objective basis for What's happening? And then you evaluate the person yeah. based on the objective outcome. I completely agree with you. Unfortunately, I, you know, up until a few years ago, I was what you, many would call a sheep. I was just going along with the herd. COVID came. I was fearful. I thought you know, what the government is telling me has to be true. And here we are a few years later and logic finally sunk in. My objective reality is kicking in and I'm taking a look at what happened, what transpired, what he said, what she said. And not only do I feel lied to, but I'm angry. Mm -hmm. Also, for those of my friends and colleagues who may not have had the epiphany that mm -hmm. I have or may not have been uh, enlightened, it's, it's difficult to communicate with them on many subjects because mm -hmm. it's all intertwined. And so I almost wish I was just oblivious to it all and just would continue living my, my life like uh, they say ignorance is bliss. But maybe... In a few years, I'll become even more enlightened about it and things will change. But where I stand right now, it's just an, it's an, I'm in murky waters, right? Kind of one foot in, one foot out. And I think there's many people who are starting to uh, come to the same enlightenment that I am as mm -hmm. well. Well, the first thing, and this is the challenge of being a human, the fundamental challenge of a human is solipsism. The idea that I'm the main character and then you realize you aren't, but you kind of have to play as you are because if you don't, 
then it's as if you don't yeah. exist. So there's always going to be tension to being human, which is unfortunately not something that people talk about. It's, it's inherently just like we're physical beings in spiritual bodies, right? You don't want to send, okay, that's easy to say, but your body and your body has desires and impulses and you're constantly in this, in this struggle. And the same thing is true of enlightenment where you think, oh, I'm, I feel like I've learned a lot and had the awakening. Why haven't other people? It's like, why didn't you have that before though? Because right. you didn't. Yeah. Everybody has to have their own awakening. So each, each of us, we, I don't want to say we have to associate people because I've disassociated from a lot of people. But we do have to have a certain humility that comes with the enlightenment, mm. which is, oh, I get it. Well, wait a minute. I didn't get it, though, until so, – because sometimes I'll think of that, too. I was like, man, I can't believe what an idiot I was at 25. <laughs> but at 25, I thought I knew it all. I was more exactly. confident at 25 than I am at 45. Right. I, I was sure of everything. Same. And then I realized, God, I was a buffoon. And I'm, <laughs> I'm sure that 10 years from now I'll think that – so you want to have page about myself now at 45 – but so you want to have patience for people. And then you don't want to be ignorant. They say ignorance is bliss. But it is until there's a crisis. And then it's not. Yeah. So it used to be that you could float around and kind of live an okay life in America. Right? You can't do that anymore. You can't really follow the blueprint, hand it out. You have a lot of dissonance and then you don't even know why. Mm -hmm. So the good part is... Even when I'm in a problem, or you know, even you in your own life as you reach problems now because of the burden of wisdom, you at least can start to troubleshoot. Mm -hmm. And you can figure, oh, I, I am in a hole. Because ignorance says, I'm in a hole. Shit, how did I get here? Oh, here's how I got here. Okay, well, I need to build a ladder and I need to get out. Yeah. It's probably going to take me a couple of years. This is going to suck, but you know what? No big deal. Versus you don't even know you're. You're, you're in the hole and they're throwing dirt, dirt on you. <laughs> and they're burying you alive and all you know now is you're yeah. like an animal. And you don't have consciousness and all you now know is fear. And this is how most people live. They live only like animals. They have an animalistic response to the TV, to the news, to peer groups, fear, hysteria. Because we're not being taught love, mm -hmm. right? It'd be delusional maybe to think that we just love everybody. That'd be a nice delusion. But that's yeah. not the delusion. The illusion is panic, hysteria, Trump. Trump's a fascist. They're like, well, why? Oh, my God, you are you voted for Trump now? You're like, wait a minute, I didn't even say I voted for Trump. Right. I just asked why you think that. <laughs> oh, my God, I didn't know what happened to you. Because they're not living like men. They're, right. they're not living like human beings. They are living like animals. So a lot of it, when you realize that, you have, in some ways, more compassion. You have less patience, but more compassion. Mm. And that's probably why I'm a little bit short with people on Twitter is, I think, you know, I do feel bad for you that you are choosing to live like an animal, but I'm not going to deal with it. Go mm. live like an animal, you know, somewhere else. Mm. Don't, don't come bring that. Because <laughs> a lot of people even who are politically aligned with me live in a constant state of doomerism. Mm. Oh, all the elections, none of it matters. It's like, then get the hell out of here. Yeah. If nothing matters, go sit in your little cubby hole. Yeah. Cry yourself to sleep. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. Why are you coming over here? Because right. they're animals. They don't even realize that they're bringing that despair energy to other people because mm -hmm. they're, not, they're not fully conscious. So you have, to, you have to become conscious. And it's better than living in a constant state of basically animalism. Yeah. I think you're absolutely right. I'm going through that phase right now, and you articulated it very well. Um, and I just must say thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you inviting me to your beautiful home, meeting you, the rest of your family, and seeing your wife again. So... Thank you, Mike. My pleasure. Thanks Appreciate for coming it. out. Boom. Cheers.